have a distinguished panel to uh, address and edify us on an issue that is as complex as uh, the media and non-specialists uh, make it out to be. Uh, but among specialists, it's, it's less complex and ought not to be as controversial. And so these are educators. This is an educational organization. All of us will come away uh, far more enlightened about uh, what are the energy interests, what are the energy complications, what are the energy ramifications, what are the energy implications for key U.S. foreign policy objectives, things that Ambassador Walter Cutler had to try to advance on behalf of the United States in conjunction with his uh, Saudi Arabian counterparts. I uh, don't know how many of you are aware that Ambassador Cutler was twice ambassador to Saudi Arabia. It was largely because he couldn't get it right the first time and they had to send it back. No. <laughs> <laughs> and we like to laugh. Uh, but we do have as our moderator uh, none other than Paul Sullivan, who's been a fixture in these gatherings. And uh, he helps with uh, uh, cerebral massage. And uh, he teaches uh, economics at the National Defense University. He's long also been associated with uh, Georgetown University and some Turkish institutes, uh, so-called think tanks. I say so-called because I haven't met an agenda t uh, think tank that was a think tank. M many of them are agenda tanks, uh, trying to be facetious and see if you're awake there. But uh, Paul Sullivan uh, wrote the uh, publication that uh, was available yesterday. I don't know if any other copies exist, but if they are, help yourself to them. They're free, uh, focusing on Saudi Arabia's 2030 vision strategic plan pluses, minuses, likelihoods, and challenges. Paul Sullivan. Well, John Duke, I didn't realize you put my article out for reading. I, I do need to update that. Uh, 2030 has been slowed down considerably. Now, uh, for uh, this panel, it's U.S. Arab Energy Dynamics, but of course, when we talk about U.S. Arab, we're talking about U.S. Arab world dynamics. Uh, each speaker will have seven minutes. Of course, given the complexity of the issue, you really will only need five. But let's say seven minutes. Questions will be collected from around the room and handed up to John Duke and to me, and we'll uh, deal with that. With regard to what I'll be saying, uh, my opinions or my opinions alone do not represent those of the U.S. government or any other entity I might be a part of. And I could say that probably is applied to everyone else in the panel, too. So we're all now protected. Uh, I will focus on, and I'll be the last speaker, on nuclear power exports to the region. I could talk about oil until the cows come home. Uh, but nuclear power is becoming a very big issue in the Middle East, and I'll also talk about the energy, water, food security nexus and the potential for war between Egypt and Ethiopia. Uh, just to begin a conversation, these things can go on for hours. Other speakers, Dr. Herman Franson, Executive Director of the Energy Intelligence Group, uh, also President of the International Energy Associates Incorporated, associated with Middle East consultants in the Amani Center in London, and also part of CSIS. He'll be the first speaker. He'll talk about the changing oil market outlook and the short and medium term and its impacts on Arab countries, hence the slowdown of 2030. Philip Cornell, uh, explaining what he does could take five minutes. I'll leave it at that he's a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council and his bio's in the booklet. Uh, he flew in from Saudi Arabia this morning. Mm. So uh, give him a little leeway when he's giving his talk. And he'll talk about the oil market impacts of the recent attacks on oil infrastructure in Saudi Arabia, may talk about electricity markets. Jean-Francois is an investment banker focused on energy-based industries, petrochemicals, aluminum, steel, and in the Gulf. He's at Johns Hopkins, where I will be starting in the spring. Uh, he is also a non-resident fellow at Atlanta Council 
uh, and an MEI scholar. He'll talk about Saudi Aramco's IPO, which is on again, off again, on again, off again, on again, off again. And my sense is it is way undervalued. I don't know where these consulting companies get their numbers from, but my sense is they're dinging it. All right, Ellen Wald, president of Transversal Consulting. She's number four, a regular at the OPEC meetings, author of Saudi Inc., The Desert Kingdom's Pursuit of Profit and Power. I started reading that book on a Saturday morning, couldn't put it down, and finished the book Saturday evening. It's definitely worth a read. Uh, she's also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council uh, with uh, Rick Morningstar's group. She'll talk about the changing paradigms of the U.S. Arab energy asset ownership and potential policy issues this raises. I'd like to know what that means. All right, Herman, start it off. Thank you, Paul. Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank my good friend, John Dugantini, for invite, inviting me again to speak at this important conference. I think every year it's more important, but this year is extremely important given the uh, uh, relationships between Middle Eastern countries and the United States. Uh, we need to get a lot more engaged than we are at the moment on the diplomatic front. Oops, so you asked me to concentrate on a few issues, a few points. I have too much material, so I, I will just make a few observations. Um, let me first say that oil prices are low, around uh, $60 a barrel or $55 for U.S. oil. And what that implies is bad news for the Arab producing countries because about a 40% cut over what they were accustomed to over the period from 2011 to 2014, when the price was around $100, now has been hoovering around uh, $60 for what we call Brent, which is the most international oil, and uh, WTI, which is the American uh, benchmark, is about $5 lower. And um, all I can say is 45 years in this business, that oil prices are cyclical. They keep changing. You cannot expect them to always be the same. And forecasts, particularly long term, are not very useful. It's just, you have to read it, but and just to give me, I give you just one example of that. But before Obama became the president, the EIA put out a study that by 2020, next year, the United States would be importing 15 million barrels a day. Today, this year, Actually, we are net zero importer, and I'll get into that, what that means. So it is dramatically changed. Nobody had expected it, but it has had a dramatic impact on the price of oil, and it has therefore also had a dramatic impact on the Gulf states. If that had not happened in the United States, this technical miracle of producing 10 million barrels a day more oil between 2007 and 2017, uh, Oil prices would have been much higher, the Gulf countries would have had much more money, but the consumer countries would have been in much worse shape than they are today. This has been a dramatic technical event, the, uh, the uh, ability, technical ability for the U.S. to produce what we call tight oil, and therefore made the United States the biggest producer. I could never believe that, because coming back to the to the 70s when oil peaked and then went down, that we ever would go back to a situation where the United States would once again become the biggest producer of liquids. By liquids, I mean crude oil and natural gas liquids uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and biofuels. If you add that up, the United States is now considerably bigger than either Saudi Arabia or Russia. But the three together, if you take the three countries now, that's almost like the new OPEC. The three countries, they don't act together, but together they produce now one third of the world's oil. Those three are the three big actors. Uh, and this has been an amazing, uh, an amazing phenomenon. So, but as I said, oil prices are cyclical, uh, things can change. And one of the things that is important also to keep in mind is that Saudi oil is among the cheapest in the world to produce, maybe about $8 a barrel. 
By contrast, the lowest tight oil in the United States, uh, all in cost, break even prices around $40, $45, but the more expensive one runs up to $55, even $60 per barrel. So we're talking about different worlds and, 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 and different prices. And so the United States can never be like Saudi, the swing producer, and open the taps quickly when it is needed for some emergency. The uh, amazing event, uh, the, sorry, the commercial break-even price in the US is about five to seven times higher than in Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states, and probably even higher uh, compared to Iraq, which now has the cheapest oil. Uh, this will last as long as the uh, producers need the income. They could produce cheap oil, but they're financially, they, are, uh, they need a price at a minimum of $60, but preferably considerably more, because they have to cut back on budgets when um, oil prices are at the current level, let alone lower. It's also important to, 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 to say that the United States is not energy independent, is not yet self-sufficient. What, what, what do I mean? We import about as much oil from the world as we export, about the same volumes. But we export a light oil and products, we import medium and a heavy oil. Because our refineries in Houston and, and Louisiana, they run much better and produce the product that the market needs with that imported oil because they maxed out on what we call the light oil, which is what most of the American oil, the tight oil that is being produced. We cannot absorb more on our own refineries and get the product mix that we need. So in other words, we remain dependent. We're still importing around 7 million barrels a day. We're exporting about the same, but we're importing that much. So what does that mean? We are still vulnerable to supply disruptions, less so than we were, but we are still vulnerable to supply disruption, and we don't make the price. The price is set by the market, and OPEC still has a significant role to play in that market. Uh, so the vulnerability has changed. Maybe right now the perception is that the, that the, that, uh, uh, the risks are insignificant. And so to me it was a big surprise when the Epcake bombing took place that the price went up $10 a barrel, as expected. I thought it would have gone up $20. But the uh, reassuring policies by the kingdom, followed by an, a massive uh, effort to uh, bring these uh, facilities back into production, had a major impact on stabilizing the market. This, for a while, they, they, they could also, uh, of course, uh, export from stocks. But the perception now is, now we went through the worst that could possibly happen, an attack on Epcake, and prices Two weeks later, we're back to the world prior to the event. So why is that? I asked with my, my uh, friends who are in the, in the trading business, and they said, in the first place, uh, we think there's plenty of oil. Secondly, the uh, demand is down. We're in a, in a global slowdown. Perhaps we could enter a recession next year. Uh, we have the market is adequately supplied, and the United States can produce more if it has to. Not necessarily all correct, but the perception is that we are secure, don't worry, very little risk. What they're leaving out is the risk related to all the potential problems. What Iran proxies did uh, in, uh, to Epcake, could, they could do again. They could do it to, uh, to shipping, they could do it to, to a lot of other uh, uh, areas in the region. We have problems right now inside, in, uh, ranging all the way from the continued problems, of course, in Syria, to serious uh, events uh, in, from Lebanon to Iraq, North Africa. All that indicates that there's still a lot of room for trouble and for potential supply disruption at a time when global spare capacity may not be more than two and a half to three million barrels a day. So let me just say in one word, the, um, the short-term outlook looks like more of the same. Uh, this year, and perhaps even next year, the United States will keep producing uh, uh, enough oil together with Brazil and a few other non-OPEC countries to um, make up, to 
make up basically to meet all of the demand growth in the world in 2019 and 2020. So we're looking at a continuation of a market of around $60 brand in 2019 and 2020. OPEC is already talking together with Russia and others to bring supply, if necessary, down another half million to a million at the end of the year for 2020. So we're looking at a market basically like that, not taking into account these issues of, uh, uh, of, of, of geopolitics, of a market pretty much in a $60 range for the next two years. Uh, several of the financial institutions like Citibank, uh, Goldman Sachs and others are talking about five years of around that price. Of course, what that does, and that's why I say the market is cyclical, that means a significant reduction has already happened in investment, so you will get within a few years when all these new projects are all on stream, we're going to see a tightening of the market because of the lack of investment since 2015 and prices may rise again. For the countries in the region, it has been bad news because at $60 a barrel, you cannot, uh, you know, you have to cut back on your, um, on your budget and that has been done significantly. Uh, but that has also a cost associated with it. You do away with all the uh, things that people are accustomed to and add a value, add a tax. Uh, it, that is not an easy thing to do. So it, it creates pressures in society. But if the forecast or the projections are correct, then they'll have to live with it for, for quite some time to come. Uh, other issue briefly put on, a, a more longer term challenge for the Gulf states, and that is climate change. Two weeks ago, I chaired a conference in London, and it's not like here. The whole conference room was surrounded, and at night we had more than a thousand bicyclists from the Extinction Rebellion, and not all hippies. There were men dressed in suits with ties. There were women in, 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 in uh, dresses on these bicycles protesting fossil fuels. Now, my own views, they're a little bit I say, uh, naive in that they think that you can turn around this juggernaut uh, overnight. Because in 40 years' time, the past 40 years, we got oil as a share of primary energy down from 45% to today 34% in the world. It took 40 years. Now the expectation is that we can do this overnight uh, over, over, in, the, uh, in, in, in the immediate future. Now, the challenge for the Gulf states is it is going to come. It's going to have an impact. If the Democrats were to win in, uh, in this country in November, you're going to see a massive, massive change in energy policy, which is going to be very bad for the oil industry. But uh, this is something that if, if, as the current views are, and they're probably going to be wrong again, global oil demand will reach a plateau or a peak around the mid-2030s, they will have to change their policies. I was going to say something about uh, geopolitics, but there is no time. So let me just say then on the, uh, uh, to, to end it, that um, the challenge is so huge around them for both short term and longer term, that if there is one thing that I would want to stress is that the desperate need for diversification. It hasn't gone fast enough. It has to happen much, much faster. The question is, to what? To what? Where do you have, at the current rates of salaries, where do you have a competitive advantage in the Gulf states and in, uh, in Iraq for that matter? Where do you have a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis the South Asian continent where you can produce something that the world needs other than hydrocarbons and their derivatives that will make the economy blossom? So I will leave out the geopolitics part, but uh, we will can discuss that in the and the questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herman. Uh, Alan, try to keep it to around seven minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Paul, for that uh, wonderful, lovely endorsement of my book. Uh, again, that's Saudi Inc., and you can buy it on Amazon or at uh, local bookstores, uh, definitely in DC. There's, I, know there's, I know there's a signed copy at uh, Bridge Street Books in Georgetown. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about Saudi Arabia or Saudi Aramco. 
uh, in addition to what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, this dovetails very nicely with what uh, Herman said. I'm going to start um, with this idea that the U.S. is now uh, a net energy exporter. That includes both crude oil and petroleum products. It's even more when you consider natural gas and LNG. And we're going, we have heard quite a bit, and we'll hear even more about this uh, mythical thing that some people like to call energy independence, although now I think the, the term they're using is energy dominance. And I'm going to talk about how energy independence is impossible in the United States in a, a very practical way, and not simply because oil is a global commodity and it's, it's priced globally, but uh, in, in a very real way uh, for the United States and also um, what the policy implications of this are. Uh, and I'm going to start with a little bit of history. I'm a historian by training, and I, I teach history. So um, I want to go all the way back to uh, 1908, when uh, oil was first discovered in the Middle East in, in Iran. And the paradigm that we saw uh, beginning uh, at that point was that Western companies would come into uh, the Arab world and uh, other parts of the Middle East, and they would uh, essentially own or, or get concessions for, they, they essentially owned and exploited Middle Eastern oil resources, and the uh, countries received uh, you know, a small cut of the profits. Then uh, starting in the 1950s, but continuing all the way <clears throat> excuse me, through uh, 1980, Middle Eastern countries uh, became, and I'm going to use uh, Zaki Amani's phrase, uh, he was the, the Saudi oil minister, uh, masters of our own commodity. And that included both nationalization, uh, sometimes violent nationalization of uh, oil companies and oil assets, uh, but also buyouts, uh, as, as we saw in the case of uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then, uh, Moving forward past that time, uh, beginning really in 1988 uh, with Saudi Aramco, but then uh, this has been a much more uh, contemporary phenomenon, Middle Eastern uh, countries and, and companies uh, began to expand globally, buying energy assets outside of their countries. Uh, Western companies have also begun to return to Arab countries, uh, investing in petrochemical and other energy resources in Arab nations as well, uh, in terms of, of joint ventures. Uh, IOCs are partnering with state oil companies around the world to uh, exploit energy resources. So whereas once uh, Arab state uh, oil companies started making so much money from high oil prices, the question was really, what, what do we do with all that money? It's not just going to the state, but they need to expand and invest elsewhere. And uh, so I'm going to kind of run down some of the investments that Arab uh, oil companies have made in uh, North America. Now, I, I'm, I'm focusing on North America simply because that's the uh, energy dynamic we're talking about here. So uh, the biggest is really um, the Motiva refinery, uh, which is wholly owned now by Saudi Aramco. But the, Aramco also owns Shell gasoline stations in the southeastern United States. Uh, Aramco also owns R&D centers in Detroit, in Ithaca, in Cambridge uh, that work on energy technology. Uh, Aramco's uh, Energy Ventures Group is a venture capital group that invests in startups uh, around the world, but a lot in the U.S. And they have uh, big, uh, important investments for companies uh, such as uh, Mana, which is a uh, software that's designed to increase efficiencies in shipping oil, uh, blockchain companies, and also uh, 3D printing companies. And those are just very, very small sampling. Uh, Qatar Petroleum owns 70% of the Golden Pass LNG uh, center. Uh, Qatar Petroleum also owns 49% of a yet as an unnamed, yet unnamed petrochemical plant to be built in the Gulf Coast, uh, which is a joint venture with Chevron Phillips Chemical. And uh, they uh, expect this to be the, potentially be the world's largest petrochemical plant with construction to start in 2021. Uh, Nova Chemicals, which is a Canadian petrochemical company, is owned uh, by International Petroleum Investment Company of the UAE, of which uh, Suhail Mazrui, the UAE Energy Minister, is Managing Director. Uh, Qatar Petroleum also owns a stake in Suncor, which is a Canadian gas unit. And right now we know that Aramco is looking to purchase gas assets in the United States, potentially worth billions of dollars. Now, um, I, don't, I don't bring this up to... to uh, 
ignite any kind of, of fear. In fact, I think that foreign investment uh, in energy assets in the United States is a good thing. That's part of the American uh, free, or relatively free, uh, free economy. And this kind of thing both increases cooperation between companies that have capital and also great expertise, uh, particularly in terms of LNG, for the United States. So I think these kinds of investments in US assets are generally beneficial and, and are beneficial just as US investments now overseas in, in Arab uh, um, ventures are also beneficial. And many of these uh, Arab companies have investments in China, in Russia, Europe, uh, South Korea, and Japan. I'm just happen to be focusing on the ones in the US. However, at the same time, the United States needs to be prepared for changing uh, relationships and issues that can arise from this. Uh, we generally do have this, this free market system. It benefits our economy. We're also a nation of laws, so we can't just decide willy-nilly we don't, we don't want this particular investment. Uh, we, we are a, con a nation of laws, and these laws don't generally restrict foreign investment except in, in very specific uh, circumstances. Yet we need to be prepared in the event that relationships uh, do change between the US and foreign countries. And I'm going to give an example that is facing the, that the United States is facing right now. It happens to be with Venezuela, but it provides kind of an illustrative example for why uh, a, level, a particular level of preparedness would be beneficial. Um, now, I'm not asserting that we're going to have bad relations with any of these countries. In fact, I think the relations are very, very good and that the investments that these countries have in American energy assets strengthens the relationship. But at the same time, you never know. And that's uh, the case with Venezuela. So um, CITGO is the wholly owned subsidiary of PDVSA, which is the Venezuelan state oil company. CITGO owns several important refineries in the United States, as well as uh, gasoline stations, which many people are probably uh, familiar with. Now, the US had good relations with Venezuela for many years. Uh, and in fact, even when Chavez uh, took over in Venezuela, uh, relations may have soured, but the energy relationship remained strong and continued to work very well. There really was very little risk. Uh, then when Maduro came to power, the relations uh, soured uh, some more, but still they, they were tense, but the oil relationship was working just fine. Then there was an election that wasn't really an election, and suddenly the United States was supporting Venezuela's opposition leader as the legitimate ruler of Venezuela, and everything has gone south. Uh, we now have sanctions on Venezuelan oil. The United States is recognizing this opposition leader as, as president, and we've created this very bizarre and very difficult situation regarding CITGO. Uh, in fact, um, CITGO, uh, PDVSA, which owns CITGO, is in such dire straits that they have, um, uh, it's entirely likely that Rosneft, which has loaned them money, can assume uh, a 50% ownership of CITGO. And that could put the US in a very, very difficult situation of having a Russian oil company owning uh, the, the company that um, does very important refining in the United States. In fact, if PDVSA misses its ne next debt payment, Rosneft could collect on that. And so we're now in a difficult situation of what do you, what, what is, what's going to happen to CITGO? People have jobs on the line. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of oil products that, that are being produced. Now we have a committee called the CFI US that evaluates potential purchases of assets in the US by foreign companies, and they can decide if the purchase cannot go through for national security reasons. But as I said, these relationships can change very quickly. Uh, what was once seen as a secure friendship or strategic partnership can change. And at one time in our history, we had uh, standing committees between uh, in industry leaders, uh, particularly in the energy industry, and uh, government counterparts that met regularly to plan uh, and to create plans for contingency situations. Uh, during World War II, this committee was called uh, the PAW, or the Petroleum Administration for War. During the early Cold War, there was uh, another one called the uh, Petroleum Administration for, for Defense. And um, these committees, had standing relationships between industry leaders and government, and they worked together to make sure that in the event of some sort of uh, catastrophe that the United States would be uh, well supplied with energy. And so, um, like uh, uh, Herman said, we don't 
we're not able to predict the future. We're, we're notoriously bad, in fact, at predicting the future when it comes to energy. And so it cannot hurt to be uh, better prepared. So uh, in terms of my uh, policy recommendations, I would say that the, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is not enough because we're talking about a wide range of energy assets. We're talking about petrochemicals and gasoline. Uh, we're talking about natural gas. In the future, we could very well be talking about solar panel uh, distribution. China is a leading producer of solar panels in the world. And so uh, one way for us to be prepared in case relationships do change is to uh, revive these kinds of committees that uh, created a standing relationship such that if there were to be a problem, these kinds of plans could be easily activated to make sure that U U.S. consumers, the U.S. military does not experience any kind of disruption in energy supplies. And uh, I have one, one other uh, kind of policy recommendation, which is that um, it's important for us to also be aware of where particular funding is coming from for a lot of these uh, assets. Uh, the government should, should perhaps be aware of indirect foreign investment in American energy assets. So uh, here's, here's a good example. Uh, there are several Arab countries, either through their sovereign wealth funds or uh, private assets uh, of country leadership or through investment vehicles that are connected perhaps to the leadership of the country or even to uh, major, uh, I'll say, aristocrats in, uh, in, the company, uh, in the country have put money into hedge funds, which then go and invest in energy assets. And uh, this is a way of basically kind of hiding who is actually uh, funding these, um, these investments. And I'm not saying that there is any nefarious intent here, but um, there, there are certainly possibilities in cases where this has happened where uh, perhaps a uh, country has, in, in certain cases, um, uh, have, um, have either had their assets seized by the government, so then suddenly the government is the one that owns the assets that are invested, say, in um, a number of shale E&P companies. And there's no way for us to know, really, or, or there's no accounting of this, uh, of this money because it's been kind of hidden through various uh, hedge funds and, and other funds. And so uh, my policy recommendation would be that um, you can't force people to, to disclose this, uh, and that, that might be actually a bad thing, but that the Department of Energy perhaps should make an effort to look into uh, the sources of funding, in particular for uh, shale companies, uh, because that's such an important part of American oil production today, and that perhaps this could be a regular uh, assessment and an ongoing assessment. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Ellen, uh, Jean. And again, folks, uh, seven minutes. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning. First, I'd like to thank John Duke Anthony for inviting me to this panel. And uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here with uh, so many people who know so much. Um, this morning, I'd like to sort of be fairly precise on what I, I'd like to talk about. I want to mention the IPO, which is, of course, the subject of the day. Everybody talks about the IPO. As was mentioned earlier, it's on, off, on, off. But uh, it might be that it's on quite a bit, but there are a few things which I think I'd like to mention about the risks of the IPO. Now, I come from the point that I, was, I am very favorable to the IPO. I've written very much on the value of Saudi Aramco, and I've, I valued Saudi Aramco myself at more than $2 trillion. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, there are still some risk inherent uh, to, to, to the IPO. Now, it's not so much the first risk, of course, is the Iranian threat. We've seen what happened in Abcake, and of course, that may scare some IPOs, some uh, IPO buyers. On the other hand, I think that is not, at least from an analysis standpoint, I don't think that's a big problem because the, um, the, the reaction of Saudi Aramco to this attack has been nothing short of heroic. It's been really fabulous. They've been able to uh, work day and night to uh, recover the, uh, the, the production. I think it also shows that the management of Saudi Ramco has been absolutely superb and that they were ready ahead of time for a lot of contingencies. So I don't think that uh, is a potentially is, is too much of a risk. I think the main risk I see is internal to Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> 
there has been a lot of changes in the oil sector, uh, and there not, may not be n many numbers of people have not been changed, but uh, some very important people have been changed. One is there's been a change in the Minister of Energy, of course, and there's been a, a big change in the chairmanship of the company. In other words, Khaled al Faliya, the, the former minister and chairman of Saudi Aramco, uh, was uh, uh, removed from his positions. Now, I just talked to a very high official from the Saudi government last week, and he was saying that it's at the request of the banks that the minister was removed because they thought that uh, they could not sell the IPO as well if there was a, seen a conflict of interest between the regulator, i.e. the Ministry of Energy and Saudi Ramco. And that makes some sense. But that implies though, very importantly, that the shares of Saudi Ramco, which are now, I'm told, and this is by the way not sure, but I'm told are owned by the Ministry of Energy, will have to be transferred away from the Ministry of Energy because there would be an obvious, if you talk about the regulatory process and the uh, conflict of interest between regulator and company, the regulator cannot own the shares of the company it regulates. Therefore, uh, it is very likely that the shares will end up somewhere else. And which other organization in Saudi Arabia could own the shares except PIF? which was really what originally was actually had been announced by the Crown Prince. So let's assume for a minute here that the PIF will own the shares. Well, then we have the chairman of uh, Saudi Ramco is also the CEO of PIF. And the new minister of energy is the brother of Mohammed bin Salman. Now, what really scares, I think, investors potentially is that there are some problems between the priorities of PIF and the priorities of Saudi Aramco. Now, what are the priorities of Saudi Aramco? I think uh, His Excellency Khaled al Faliyad had a very interesting, very ambitious uh, strategy for Saudi Aramco. He wanted to make Saudi Aramco into the largest IOC in the world. And that implies if, if it could prove to the world that uh, Saudi Aramco was worth was a, an IOC, it could be priced like an IOC. And I've done the math. Most of the IOCs in the world are traded on the market at 20 times their earnings. Hence why I thought that $2 trillion was very good for Saudi Aramco. And not, it did not need to be any lower than that. Khaled al Fariya's plan including, included very major investment overseas. It wanted to guarantee a base load for Saudi oil pretty close to the overall production of Saudi Arabia. That implies building refineries. They already have Motiva, as Ellen mentioned. They have also refineries in China, in Korea, and so on there. But they were also negotiating for very large investments and a refinery in India. They have large refineries in Korea as well. They also <clears throat> wanted to go into the natural gas business. And that's very important because, as we all know, Saudi Arabia is a large producer of gas, but it doesn't have enough for its own needs. And most of, most of the gas, not all, but most of the gas in Saudi Arabia is associated and therefore dependent on how much oil is being pumped. But it had plans to buy uh, Sampra, or to buy, uh, tw I think, 25% of Sampra LNG in the United States. It had plans to buy very, and I don't know how many billions, but very large uh, number of billions into Novatec in Russia to become a producer, which is a producer of LNG as well, and a very fast growing one. It also developed gas trading, and I started trading already. It also wanted to invest uh, in downstream extensively. Uh, in all its refineries, it had spent billions of dollars uh, increasing the quality of the uh, products. In other words, the bottom of the barrel is being upgraded, and that's very expensive in Saudi Arabia to do, but they're doing it. Of course, they invested $20 billion in Sadara, which is a very advanced chemicals company in a joint venture with Dow. 
They also had a major plan, and they have a major plan today to, in, uh, to increase the petrochemical production uh, of the Sator refinery in joint venture with Total. It has, of course, the SABEC acquisition, and uh, I can make a little plug myself on this. Uh, I just published yesterday <laughs> an, uh, at the Atlantic Council an article on the SABEC Saudi Aramco acquisition, uh, or the acquisition of SABEC by Saudi Aramco. But um, it, has a, um, it also had very large plans to do a project with SABEC uh, to go from chemicals to, uh, from, from crude to chemicals directly, which is a very highly advanced technological feat, which has never really been done in the world before. That means that the priority of Khaled al Faria was to spend 100, maybe more money, billion dollars, probably more, uh, on, on making Saudi Ramco this company worth 20 times earnings. On top of it though, but Saudi Ramco is still responsible for funding 80% of the Saudi budget. That's a lot of money. The, uh, the, the, uh, the priorities of PIF are not quite the same. Uh, and the priorities of PIF is that um, PIF wants to be, if I can find my page, but I'm, I cannot find it. So uh, the, the public investment fund really is trying to diversify the economy away from oil. Uh, it is going extensively into very advanced technologies, why it's bought Tesla and Uber. It is also going extensively into the um, hospitality business, and uh, into building new cities like Neom and uh, Amalia and other companies, uh, cities of this nature, which will cost hundreds of billions of dollars without any uh, guaranteed returns. Those are very high risk uh, investment. Even the Tesla investment, which went up 21% yesterday, which I'm sure was a very nice uh, bonus for, for PIF, is still down about half of its invest original investment. So the priorities of PIF are totally different than the priorities of Saudi Ramco. But PIF has the mean to act on Saudi Ramco and um, uh, can push money out of Saudi Ramco which, for, for itself, which may in the long term hurt Saudi Ramco. So Saudi Ramco will be responsible for funding the state Still, that hasn't changed, and it will not change anytime soon. It wants to spend over $100 billion on being an international oil company, which is what gives value to the company. And it also now may be forced to fund a lot of the PIF investments. Now, we talk about the PIF investments, and um, we're, we're not sure really whether they can do all of this at the same time. The borrowing capacity of Saudi Aramco is enormous. They, they, have, they don't have very much debt to this today. Uh, they, they have the $19 billion of long-term debt as of their 2018 figures. They added $12 billion in the first half of the year. So ultimately, they could easily borrow on the market if you're a banker and care about leverage, they could borrow, they borrow another $100 billion. But borrowing $100 billion is not small. I mean, large banks, you know, they say, oh, it's only $100 billion. But uh, I think regulators may start worrying about having Chase having maybe $100 billion of exposure to Saudi Arabia. I mean, that could be a problem. So yes, there are a lot of people eager to invest money in projects, in bonds, in projects in Saudi Arabia. but. Ultimately, if you borrow too much, it's too much. Uh, yes, they can issue shares at 5%, and that 5% may be worth 20 billion, but if the market understands that uh, the, the, the pressure on Saudi Ramco is intense to dish money out, they might start worrying that the actual operational budget of the company might get hit. Saudi Ramco spends 20 to 40 billion dollars every year on itself. And when I say on itself, it means their salaries and so on, but mostly on new technologies for their oil field, the maintenance of their oil fields and whatnot. If that money is put under pressure, then the quality of Saudi Ramco will be impaired, and therefore the value will be impaired. 
So it's, I think that's the main risk today, is the impairment of the value of Saudi Ramco because of the new structure of the company. And I just will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Always learn something from you. <laughs> Philip? <clears throat> Thanks. I'm going to put a stopwatch so I make sure I stick, uh, <laughs> keep, keep it to time. Um, I, you know, I, in the introduction, uh, you heard that I was going to maybe start talk by talking about what are the effects of uh, the recent uh, attacks on Abcake on, on the oil market. But, you know, frankly, we've heard a lot about uh, oil today from, uh, and from, from very respected colleagues. Um, and, uh, and, and, but suffice to say, when there was, and, and I'm happy to talk about, for example, that, those kind of issues, uh, and particularly about this attack. I mean, you know, when I was at NATO and we were worried about critical energy infrastructure protection, we were looking at places like Abcake uh, as one of the most critical nodes uh, in, the, in the structure. When I was at the IEA and we were looking at coordinating uh, strategic, international strategic stock releases, uh, Abcake was obviously uh, front and center. And when I was at Aramco, uh, we were very conscious of the fact uh, that Abcake was a central uh, node, not only in the kingdoms, uh, uh, oil uh, system, but also in the global system. Uh, so when the uh, attacks did come, uh, as we've heard, um, you know, the price reaction was pretty quick, uh, and that was sort of the, the, one of the worst case scenarios that we had been considering. The price reaction was pretty quick, uh, but not very long lived. And as we've heard, this is partly because, uh, you know, what was going on in the market. Uh, on the supply side, uh, we have a lot of new uh, supply coming on, particularly out of uh, the U.S. in the form of uh, shale oil. Um, you know, I'll uh, say that you know, in the in the U.S. Uh, last year, uh, we put on uh, more production of oil and of gas than any country at any period in history. So there's a huge amount of growth coming on the supply side, and obviously on the demand side. Uh, oil is facing sort of a long-term uh, demand softness. So what the market was looking at uh, this year is obviously the effects on demand that are coming out of uh, trade disputes, uh, increasing mercantilism around the world, uh, and the potential for demand to be hit in the short term. But in the long term, we're also looking at real technological changes uh, that are going to be having uh, impacts on oil, particularly in a few sectors, uh, like the transport sector, uh, and that gives the prospect of peak oil demand going out into sort of the mid 2030s uh, and beyond. So oil is very important, obviously, uh, to what's going on in the world and will remain so for a long time. But it ain't the future. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about um, is what's going on uh, now in terms of the power market uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, and particularly uh, the rise of renewables. Uh, because because exactly it is that change uh, in the oil market and sort of the long-term structural weaknesses uh, of oil prices that are causing uh, countries, particularly in the Gulf and big oil producers, uh, to go through economic uh, transformation programs, right? Because they realize that over the long term, uh, this is not going to be a sustainable uh, path in terms of funding their budgets uh, and, and creating employment uh, which is particularly important with rising populations uh, uh, across the region. Um, so, in fact, it's the changing uh, energy market globally that's forcing these countries to think about how do they reform. Uh, so it's no surprise that a big component of a lot of those national transformation, economic transformation programs uh, are large increases uh, in the uh, penetration of renewables uh, into the power sector uh, over the next couple of decades. And that's not because necessarily uh, you know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a huge push uh, for environmental sustainability or mitigating climate change in the region, uh, even though it's obviously one of the regions that's going to be most immediately and hardest hit by the impacts of climate change in terms of livability. Um, but it's really because of the hard facts uh, that going forward, uh, uh, renewable energies uh, are going to be the most cost competitive option for countries, uh, cash-strapped uh, budget governments uh, that are facing endemic budget constraints over the medium to long term in terms of meeting rising power demand that's coming out of expanding populations, uh, economic growth, uh, and, and the need to actually address some of those needs inside um, uh, the economy uh, and the society. Renewables 
uh, at the same time, obviously, uh, are going through huge changes, and particularly in terms of rapidly falling uh, costs uh, of, of generation, uh, generation costs. Um, you know, until maybe 2013, 2014, the story about renewables uh, in the Middle East was really driven by uh, either sort of political signaling in places like Saudi Arabia where there were, you know, efforts to put on small amounts of renewables starting in sort of 2005 that never really came to much. Where there was sort of action early on was really where there was need because I think, you know, the message about why we see big changes inside uh, the power sector and changes towards uh, renewables is going to be driven fundamentally by need. So it was in places like Morocco uh, where there wasn't uh, a lot of uh, uh, natural resource. Um, but now, uh, in, particularly since 2014, 2015, uh, there's been a, huge, a rapid increase. And, and looking out over the next 15 years, um, there's going to be a continuing rapid increase. So uh, between 2015 and to 2018, something like three times the amount of renewables uh, 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 were added inside the GCC. Um, and by 2030, we're looking at something like 80 gigawatts of installed capacity. To give you an idea uh, of what that means, Saudi Arabia now is at about 70. Uh, so that's a huge increase uh, in terms of the, 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 the amount of renewables inside the power system. Um, what happens when you try to increase uh, the share of renewables rapidly uh, in a context of increasing uh, generation capacity and increasing power demand um, means that particularly if you want the private sector to be doing a lot of that investment and taking the pressure off of your budget, uh, you need to be thinking about domestic uh, power sector reform. That's something that had been, again, also going on in fits and starts throughout the region over the past uh, 10 years. Um, but I think right now we've seen a real impetus to make that change. Um, and again, they've been a big, effort, a big component uh, of those uh, economic transformation programs. Um, and, and, and at the same, and that's hard, right? Because that means actually getting under the hood and fixing some of the nuts and bolts and, and introducing competition uh, into a power sector that's been traditionally dominated by big, vertically integrated monopolies, state-owned monopolies. Um, uh, and, and at the same time, uh, if, if you want to sort of uh, achieve that kind of flexibility that's required uh, in a power system that's marked by this kind of intermittent uh, power, power generation sources, um, you also see that there's a big incentive to trade, right? To increase the size of, of, of the grid that you're working across, um, and, to, and that means increasing trade with partners. Um, and that also is something that is not necessarily new to the region, to the Middle East or to the Gulf, um, particularly in places like the GCC. You know, there has been uh, inter interconnections, uh, significant interconnections uh, between between uh, some of those countries. And in fact, since about 2009, an independent uh, GCC, uh, in, uh, GCCIA, an independent organization um, that can help to uh, facilitate some of that trade. But the utilization of those connections has been very, very, very low, something about on the order of 4 to 5%, compared to a place like Europe, where international interconnections um, are about 50%. And why is that? That's because if you don't have price discovery at home uh, or, or a reformed domestic power sector uh, and you have subsidized power, which has been a huge part of the political bargain inside uh, Middle Eastern countries, particularly Gulf countries for a long time, uh, you can't actually be trading because you can't have sort of a, a, a price that you agree upon to trade across borders. Um, and so, so, I, so what I think what's interesting to see in the region is that these kind of uh, changes in the global energy economy that are driving uh, political changes inside the region, um, as well as technological changes in terms of the integration of renewables, um, is going to be changing the picture a little bit and creating kind of a perfect storm to actually achieve some of those kind of reforms um, domestically, but also in terms of countries getting together and finally getting over some of the hurdles that are required to increase power trading throughout the region. Um, and that includes, at the political level, creating the institutions, and particularly the technical institutions, that are necessary to facilitate those changes. And that in itself is going to have, I think, a big impact on the politics of the region. Um, because in order to 
face sort of the economic future and, 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 and respond to sort of the demand and the growth in the region that's necessary. In fact, there's going to be greater economic impetus uh, to reap the efficiencies of trade and cooperation uh, among countries of the region. Um, because all along the line, it is hard, and all along the line, there's going to be temptations uh, to do shortcuts. Uh, and one of those shortcuts, for example, is going to be instead of trying to uh, introduce competition into your sector, uh, trying to do it yourself with sort of uh, uh, debt-driven fiscal spending. And I think that that's a temptation that we've seen in places like Saudi Arabia, where in 2016 and 17 there were big efforts that I think were relatively successful and commendable uh, to start opening the power sector. Um, but we've seen as things have started to be a little bit tough and there have been sort of setbacks and things have you know, gone in fits and starts, uh, the pressure to move quickly has meant also that, that, um, it, it, that, there, that for example, uh, there has been the promotion of national champions, if you like, or the investment um, from the state into companies like Aqua Power. They've been a very successful private uh, example, um, but to get shares in, 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 in a local company like Aquapower and then to uh, promote it as a national champion. Um, the, other, uh, the other temptation, I think, is to look to uh, one-off strategic investors uh, that will give you the kind of uh, investment, for example, in transmission infrastructure with one handshake rather than necessarily uh, going onto the open market. And I'm thinking about, uh, for example, Chinese uh, BRI kind of um, um, investments. Um, because I think at the end of the day, this, you know, we always talk about oil in the context of kind of high politics and what it means for strategy in the region. But in the future, I think we need to start thinking about the power sector um, in those same kind of terms. Uh, because, you know, when we think about how the world is changing from an energy perspective um, and what the role, for example, of, of, of power sector uh, changes are going to be, um, that includes, for example, uh, uh, strategic efforts to start linking grids and start um, creating investment and ownership um, using, for example, foreign technology um, all along the, the, the line. Um, and that's why I would say, for example, that uh, when we talk about what are some of the, and I'll just finish by, we were asked to say, what is a, a policy recommendation from the U.S.? Um, I would say uh, it's very much in the U.S.'s interest to promote uh, this kind of uh, power trade and the integration of power markets in a region like the Middle East, particularly in a context of uh, open and competitive bidding and open and competitive uh, trade um, in order to promote uh, the kind of um, uh, 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 free and competitive technological options uh, that can uh, create the kind of economic growth that, that we want, um, and for the region itself to sort of stave off any kind of potentially predatory um, investment or strategic investments um, that might be sort of a tempting option otherwise. So I'll just finish with that, and uh, we can talk about. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to start out with the recommendation. I am really irritated that the U.S. is backing away from the Middle East. And I consider this anti-strategic, counter-strategic, and against the interests of the United States. The betrayal of the Kurds recently was the penultimate losing strategy, and this will play out over the next few years in such a big way that we are going to pay a price. I'm going to focus on what the U.S. could do more in the Middle East by focusing on nuclear power. Our industry in this country is moribund. We are the lowest exporters of nuclear power in the world. Guess who's the largest exporter of nuclear power in the world? The Russians. The Russians are moving in. They're rushing into the Middle East with nuclear power plants like in Egypt, four one gigawatt plants on the north coast of Egypt. The Russians are lending the Egyptians $30 billion at 3%. Those plants will be around for 80 years. The new technologies can last for 80 years. It will take 10 years to build them, 10 years to wind them down. So the Russians will have 100 years of influence. What influence would we have to counter this? Saying the Middle East is no longer important to us because we produce so much oil is a non sequitur 
because we trade with countries that import oil from the Middle East and virtual oil is still part of the equation. The Russians have nuclear agreements all over Africa. They just visited Saudi Arabia and had a nuclear agreement which is not clarified, certainly not to build a plant, although RT sent something out that they will do a joint plant with the US, which I would put at zero probability. <laughs> zero. Fake news. Don't believe it. They also visited, Putin visited, notice Putin visited, when they land in a Middle Eastern country, it's the full court press. When we land in the Middle East country, it's the full court retreat. I despise what's going on here now. Excuse me. And maybe I'll have my job tomorrow morning. Russia's been helping Iran with Bushir and the next plants that will be coming into Iran. And what can we do to stop this? Nothing. Zero. We have to be in the region. We have to have leverage. The US is backing away. Russia is moving in. China is moving in, but with commerce and trade, not leverage. The Russians don't have the technology nor the money to move forward with commerce and trade the way the Chinese can. And the Chinese aren't as good as leverage in the region and fake news and sending out whispering campaigns. The Russians are beautiful at this and ugly at the same time. Break, break, Ethiopia and Egypt, China and Russia. China is a big backer of Ethiopia. It is moving factories to Ethiopia. It sees Ethiopia as a possible anchor to build its reputation in the region. China is a big investor in Egypt with its infrastructure and industrial uh, investments in the Suez Canal area. China can be a broker to the Nile problems between Egypt and Ethiopia. Russia has been a broker. The foreign ministers of Egypt and Ethiopia visited Putin in Moscow to try to find an answer to this. For someone who's been studying the region for decades, I felt nauseous when I heard that. They did not come here first. We had to invite them. They didn't try to come here and move forward. The Blue Nile in Ethiopia is about 60 to 65 percent of all the water for Egypt. Some, uh, most of the rest comes from the White Nile, a bit of rain, underground aquifers, which are fossil water, and other sources. Egypt uses about 99 percent of its water. If the Ethiopians fill up that dam, the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, too quickly, the Nile will not have enough water to run the electricity plants, the hydro plants in Aswan and elsewhere. The Sudanese are going to have a similar problem. Will not have enough water for the irrigation needs. It will be falling into a water, food, and energy crisis. The Egyptians know this. There are discussions of war in both capitals. The president of Ethiopia yesterday said he could find a large number of people to be in a, a military for him to fight the Egyptians. What is that, a joke? The Egyptian military is by far the most powerful in the region. Why are we even talking about this? The solution is diplomatic. The solution is economic. And the solution, as a recommendation, is that the United States gets more connected with this. We can be the brokers. We should get more involved. The foreign minister should come here first. Nuclear power is a potentially huge source of electricity for the region and also a huge source of clean water. There are ways to create an energy other than this hydropower plant. There are many different ways of doing this. But of course, with nuclear, you have to deal with proliferation, security issues, maintenance issues, particularly in those countries that don't exactly focus on this. So I bet you never heard someone talk about hydropower, Ethiopia, Egypt, and nuclear power in the same discussion. It's all interconnected. And when it comes to Ethiopia's power potential, there's massive geothermal potential. This hydropower plant is unnecessary, completely unnecessary and disruptive. I think I'll end it at that. <laughs>
Controversial enough? Thank you. Question. All right. John Duke, you want to ask the questions, or should I do that? No, I wanted you to ask them. Let's see here. Uh, how can the U.S. I'm going to read uh, <clears throat> half a dozen questions because they're all great in their varying degrees. You choose which ones you want to address, if any. If you want to combine answers, overlap any, that's fine. How, uh, I'll read them out quickly though first, and then you raise your hand as to uh, response. How can the U.S. help Egypt, Lebanon, and the Palestinian Authority develop their industries to export? their oil and gas reserves. <clears throat> How can the U.S. renewable energy industry benefit from the drive of Gulf countries toward clean energy production? How can the United States prevent the potential collapse of the oil industry in Libya as a result of the ongoing political turmoil and the security situation? How might the U.S. and Arab states work together on renewable energy projects in the Middle East with consideration given to successful models such as MASTAR. And for the novice or the non-specialist, you'd have to explain what MASTAR is in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, how will cheap prices, uh, how, excuse me, how will energy prices be affected in the future by disagreements over market share? How can Arab countries and the Gulf states in particular utilize their topographic advantages to capitalize in the renewable energy market with specific consideration for wind and solar power? How, if at all, will the decline in oil prices alter the political influence of GCC countries in the United States, as well as in the regions that rely more heavily on Arab oil than the United States? How will the LNG, liquefied national gas, uh, market, <clears throat> given market forces that keeps prices locked at a low level of sale, affect the future of the Arab region's economic uh, development. And lastly, how has the decline in oil prices over time impacted GCC domestic infrastructure and foreign investment initiatives? Note that all of those uh, are uh, prefaced with how. And this is delivered by design and by testing and thesis and results on our side. Uh, uh, the questions that drive policymakers nuts are the W ones, f f six of them. Who needs to do this? Why does it need to be done? When does it need to be done? Where will we be if we do it? Where will we be if we don't do it? Sometimes weather anything needs to be done. In other words, if it's not broken, don't try to fix it there. But the most difficult and vexing of all is an H question, how? You cannot answer that yes or no, okay? Go at it. Who wants to go first? Everyone got all the questions? <laughs> Ellen? I'll, I'll tackle the, the question of, of how um, has the decline in oil prices impacted GCC influence? Uh, and I think that, that we're seeing a different paradigm right now, the, the paradigm that we kind of what we're very used to seeing was um, GCC countries produce oil, it's sold at high prices, and that in some respect makes the United States somewhat beholden to uh, these countries in a, a political or military way, in the sense that the U United States is a customer, and these countries were the producer and, and supplier. And that relationship has absolutely been altered by uh, the low oil price environment. However, um, I think that we were already seeing a, a change underway in terms of, of what I spoke about, which are GCC countries investing in energy resources in the United States. And I think that ultimately that relationship of uh, these, these uh, oil companies in these countries investing in, in assets and developing these things alongside American energy companies will produce a much stronger relationship and a better relationship than one of uh, producer and consumer. Okay, thank you. Now, for the interest of time, if each one of you just take one, you can combine them, overlap them, duplicate them as you wish, um, and, and uh, can strictly confine your response to two minutes, uh, please, so we can 
be as orderly today as we were yesterday. Jean Francois. Um, thank you. Uh, these are such great questions. They're educations yes. in themselves. Uh, thank you. I just uh, maybe to tackle the LNG point a little bit, uh, since I talked a little bit about gas, but not much. But uh, the um, the LNG uh, market, of course, is is going through a lot of questioning right now because there are so many plants being built that the people are worried that the future prices will be very low. On the other hand, the demand is continuing to increase, even though the demand in China, which had been increasing by 40, 50, 30 percent per year, uh, has always taken up the slack. Now it's a little, they are worried that the Chinese uh, demand may not increase as quickly. But nevertheless, Qatar had uh, decided to increase production by 30 million tons per year, which is huge. Uh, and uh, at what price? We don't know. That That is now going to be decided. The whole pricing system on LNG is rapidly changing. It was based on the price of oil, and now it's becoming mostly uh, based on the demand and supply for natural gas in the world, especially for LNG. A little point uh, that is per not enough mentioned, because I think it's, uh, I don't know why, but it's very interesting, is Oman, which was one of the first LNG producers in the Middle East, th their production had started to decline because their gas fields had declined pretty substantially. But they have brought in uh, BP and Shell, and now these two companies have really developed a massive tight gas technology in Oman, and Oman is probably the only other uh, producer of gas in the world that's using that kind of technology after the United States. Mm -hmm. It's Compared to the US, it's small, if you like, but uh, Oman is now back to exporting its full load of LNG and will have a major impact in, 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 the, in the region. Mm -hmm. Perhaps in the, in the longer future, if the demand for gas continues to increase, uh, there will be some major developments in Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia is one of the largest shale gas fields in the world between Bahrain and the uh, Rawar <coughs> field in Saudi Arabia. They've not, they've not really started anything there. They'll wait for the prices to, uh, and, and the technology to become cheaper. And the same for Bahrain, who is trying to develop a similar type field parallel to that one closer to the Bahrain shore. So I think the LNG is going to have a major impact on the Middle East, perhaps not as much as the oil has been. But uh, I think we can be pretty hopeful that it's yeah, okay. good. Thank you, John Francois. Superb response. Philip, and then Herman. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. I mean, there was a few questions there on renewables. Um, I will just uh, say first about the topographical advantages. Indeed, I mean, one of the big benefits about having integrated grids, right, is that you can balance uh, different patterns of supply and demand. And one of the great things across the Middle East is, even though it's sort of sunny everywhere, there are big variations, um, particularly in terms of wind attributions. Um, in uh, Saudi Arabia, we've seen sort of the uh, 400 megawatt uh, uh, big wind project that came online that can be uh, very good uh, in terms of integrating, in terms of balancing um, other kinds of uh, production inside the grid. So, so there are huge topographical advantages. Um, and eventually, uh, I think if, inter if interconnection and long distance uh, 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 transmission infrastructure goes far enough, uh, be using the great kind of topographical advantages of the Middle East to supply larger markets, like for example in Europe, like for example in India, um, there have been discussions about how we can build that kind of infrastructure uh, realistically, but there's a huge potential there. Um, from the US, how, how, how can U.S. cooperation uh, or U.S. firms benefit from this? I would say from a policy perspective and being here in Washington, uh, step one is to get our act together uh, on things like the, uh, the Development Finance uh, Corporation and also the uh, Exim Bank, uh, both of which um, are, have had big problems over the last couple of years in terms of uh, making sure that they are continuously have the appropriations that they need. Um, and in fact, uh, the DFC was uh, postponed just earlier this month. Uh, so I think making sure that we have uh, the right kind of programs that can offer uh, U.S. companies uh, the kind of uh, guarantees and the kind of access uh, and the kind of money that they need to be able to compete uh, 
Uh, you're never going to out-China China, China uh, but uh, allow them to compete in a relatively uh, open and competitive environment that we can also encourage uh, our Arab friends and neighbors to create and maintain. Um, those kind of things would be good, obviously not just for creating uh, a sustainable growth uh, and an energy ecosystem in the, in the region itself, um, but also making sure that American companies and American technology are part of that story. Super. Philip, uh, last word. Herman. I just want to, um, I was going to bring that up in the introduction. What I see, see happening now is a new north-south conflict, and that's on climate change. In the West, where we are relatively well off, particularly in, in Europe, but it's, well, it's becoming in the US too, an enormous, almost aggressive move towards climate change at all costs. The, the cost is going to be horrendous, running in the trillions of dollars, and will reduce the demand for fossil fuels, coal, uh, the oil, and even natural gas. At the same time, there is, there is energy poverty in much of the East. In a country like India, the only resource it has is coal, and for the rest, there's very little oil and very little gas. They want to develop. They want to bring energy to the 400 million people who have no electricity today. So to them, climate change is something that is secondarily to uh, reducing the NOx and the SOx in the, in the, in the cities and to uh, provide electricity to the poor. And since all the growth in the future, I would say almost all the growth for energy is going to be the developing countries, we are in now for the beginning of a potential serious conflict the north and south on what kind of energy to use and how fast to reduce the fossil fuel content of our energy mix. Mm -hmm. We've had five individuals who've been superb, and we could have had five CEOs from the from the big five in the energy uh, business, and their uh, presidents, their chairmen, uh, chairwomen, and their COOs, CFOs, but or chief engineers. But we've had something better people who can speak more frankly here, long time students of the issues and not afraid uh, to speak the truth. Thank all five of you. Terrific.